Hello, everybody, and welcome to Dot to Dot. Today, we're going to talk about the last cipher document, which is the one discovered by uh, Philip Stevenson. Now, Philip Stevenson was on the Curse of Oak Island show, uh, I believe, episode eight. No, season eight, episode 22, uh, Be There or T-Square in uh, 2021. And we're going to look at his uh, document. And I'm also going to give you the account that he has graciously shared with me uh, of how he discovered it and the history behind how it came to the public knowledge. And it's very interesting. And we'll get into that right now. So let me bring up my presentation and I'll put it on slideshow for you guys. So this is the document that is shown on the episode of the Curse of Oak Island. Uh, the cipher is similar to the Kempton cipher, which is on the 90 foot stone and is also the same cipher that is in the formula. So this is the formula and this is all, these are all original documents that basically attest to each one of the, the uh, 90 foot stone is the one at the bottom. And these are the notes of Austin Kempton who basically brought to the public knowledge the 90-foot stone. And we have some interesting takes on this. And uh, one of them, uh, Phil Stevenson brought to my attention. And I'm going to share that with you at the end of this program. But the, here is the uh, Phil Stevenson document and La Formula. And you can see that they're all using the same cipher code. And can these be copycat fakes? Well, we would have to start with the 90 foot stone as being a fake. And then we would go to La Formula and then to the Phil Stevenson document. I'm going to show you uh, at least some good evidence, good arguments why there's no way that these people would do that or could do that. So let's move on. This is the uh, origins of this document. It was a secret document. And I'll read it and you can follow along. In 1995, while researching my family tree, my older brother and I were shown a collection of personal belongings that once belonged to the father of a child that was adopted by my great-great-grandparents after the mother had died during childbirth. The original owner of these personal belongings, the child's father, was a man named Robert D. Austin Stevenson, and the items consisted of a leather bag containing Masonic regalia and two letters, one of which was dated 1870 and was sent from a brother, Charles Warren. And it went into detail about the work that Warren had been undertaking in Jerusalem. At the time that this uh, letter was sent, we discovered that Stevenson was working as a journalist for the Pall Mall Gazette in London. So Charles Warren was a Freemason, so was uh, Robert D. Austin Stevenson, and apparently they knew each other. So uh, he had letters from Charles Warren. The connection between Charles Warren and this uh, ciphered message is, uh, it can be assumed, but it's not completely uh, corroborated. So a few weeks later, when we discovered Charles uh, Warren was the British archaeologist who led an excavation between the site of Solomon's Temple in Jerusalem from 1867 to 1870, and that he later became known as Sir Charles Warren. So there's a big connection with Robert DeAnstern Stevenson and Charles Warren, and he has letters from Charles Warren in this package of the regalia and the ciphered note, which hadn't been discovered yet when they first uh, saw the regalia. So this is in 1995. So here's Phil's explanation of his connection between Robert D. Austin Stevenson. 
He says, firstly, I'm not a direct descendant of Robert Johnson Stevenson, but we both share a common ancestor as my seven times great grandfather was Robert Johnson's four times great grandfather. In addition, my great grandparents adopted the illegitimate child and Robert Johnson Stevenson frequently visited that child at my grandparents' home, at my great-great-grandparents' home. He says, I have no idea how some of his belongings end up being left at my family's, or, and we'll find out later, it may be his aunt's home. But Robert's uh, regalia may have been left by accident while visiting the child following a lodge meeting. So he doesn't really know how his aunt ended up with this regalia that belonged to Robert Johnston Stevenson. They only know this connection between the child and his great-great-grandparents. And uh, apparently his aunt probably lived in the home that his great-great-grandparents lived in, probably through uh, inheritance. But the letters were discovered with his regalia were clearly dated 1870. These are the other letters. However, the cipher document was found inside a concealed pocket within the apron, and there is no date on this document. So we're going to get on to the discovery. Here's Charles Warren, a picture of Charles Warren. Both Warren and Stevenson were Freemasons, and they also were members of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, I don't know if that still is in existence, but it's a it's an offshoot of Freemasonry, um, very esoteric in nature, and uh, but that's the history of their connection between the two. So around two thousand twenty, uh, around two thousand and two, I was attending a lodge meeting with a with the when the vintage. Masonic regalia that belonged to Robert Johnston was raised in conversation, and we were asked if we could arrange uh, to borrow it and bring it to the next meeting. And the following month, we turned up with the regalia, and some of the uh, several of the members were keen to give it a good look over. This is when we discovered that the apron had a sewn pocket into the lining underneath its triangular flap. Inside the pocket was a folded piece of paper containing symbols and phrases which we assumed to be something to do with Freemasonry. However, not even the senior lodge member were familiar with the symbols or the meaning of the phrases. Fortunately, before returning the regalia to my aunt, I decided to photocopy the document. So that's how we have this document. But at this point, he doesn't know anything about how the cipher is connected with uh, La Formula, and there's no way he could have because La Formula really wasn't decoded until 2017, 2018. So let's go on. Now here's the time. Uh, here's the document right here, and you can see things about this document. It, it looks very old. You know, it has these rounded corners, which I believe were uh, pretty much uh, in circulation in the 1870s uh, during that time. I know photographs were die cut with this rounded corner. Now, where this piece of paper, how big it is, I don't know. But also you can note that this is definitely done with a quill pen because of the different... Uh, the different widths, especially in the triangles and in the circles. You can see it's heavier down here and here. So this was definitely done with a quill pin, whether it was a uh, mechanical uh, or a metal quill, which was available in this time period, or a regular quill pin, we don't know. Whether it was a dipping quill or it actually had a fountain uh, built into the pen. Uh, which also was uh, somewhat available during the 1870s. So nevertheless, it was done by a quill pen. Oops. Uh, I wanted to show you that. I'm going to have to go back. Hold on. I have to 
go back to this right here. And now we'll go back to slideshow. Oops, made another mistake. Sorry about that. Wanted to go right here. Uh, let's see, view slideshow. I guess we have to enter through. Sorry guys, okay. So this is what I wanted to show you. This is the uh, document close up and you can see that the transfer of ink has been transferred from uh, the writing onto the opposite side. Now, I believe this is indicative of older documents that have been in storage. They tend to do this. They tend to bleed over into the other piece uh, when they've been you know, together for a long period of time. So just another little uh, thing about how authentic that this may be. So, okay, so this is basically the timeline. And the reason I'm showing this is because it shows that when uh, Philip Stevenson found this document, uh, he didn't really know what he had. And it wasn't until later, uh, more than... I would say, what, 20 years, 22 years later, he discovered what what the meaning has in its connection to Oak Island and La Formula. Because you can read, he found, the, he found it in 1995, and then in 2002, he took it to the lodge where they found the, uh, where they discovered it, the, the cipher message. So he had it for seven years and didn't even know about the cipher message. And then in 2015, he donated the, uh, the cipher and all the regalia to the Grand Lodge in England. Now, this is unfortunate. I wish he would have kept it, but he didn't really know what he had until 2017. And in 2017, it was when he was watching the Curse of Oak Island, that his daughter recognized the symbols on the 90-foot stone being similar to the Warren cipher. So I've talked to him about this. He's tried to go back to the United Grand Lodge of England to get it. And since it was his older brother that donated it, uh, it was um, not, he did not know who he gave it to. And it he hasn't been able to get a hold of it. So this is unfortunate, but it doesn't, to me, it does not uh, diminish in its authenticity since he has a photograph of it. And uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, he doesn't have it since he didn't know about it until 2017. So this is his uh, testimony on the translation and of course, he says, uh, initially he tried to decode the document using the Kempton cipher, and the result was inconclusive due to the symbols being missing from the solution and the words it produced not making any sense. This led me to believe that the phrases written adjacent to the symbols must have therefore been the meaning of the symbols. And then in 2020, he found an article written by Doug Kroll, which is the Blockhouse blog, where in 2017, uh, Doug Kroll was uh, deciphering the formula. And it really wasn't until 2017, 2018, that the full uh, translation of the formula was known. And uh, this, which he then says, uh, the La Formula cipher, which concluded the solution to the cipher, was in French, because we know La Formula was in French. And uh, he also became aware of the missing symbols. So when the Warren uh, Stevenson cipher was reexamined, this solution was also to be found in French and contained several details shared with La Formula. So this is the translation of the Warren Stevenson cipher. And we will find, I'll show you that it is in French and the symbols match.
But the, the interesting thing is that the information that is decoded from the cipher is very similar to the formula and its content, which the 45 is in the formula, the 522 is in the formula, the 145 is not in the formula, and the 1065 is in the formula. Now, this says Cruzier, and this was left out of uh, Phil Stevenson's uh, presentation, is he puts 45, but actually it says dig 40 feet. It says uh, 40 feet, and it actually says dig 40 feet. So this is interesting to me because in uh, the vault theory, you do dig 40 feet. And that is in part of the 90-foot stone. It says 40 feet below, uh, 2 million pounds are buried. Well, 40 feet below what? And I believe it's basically 40 feet below the slate layer, which is 3 feet below the surface. And... This is interesting that it says dig 40 feet. In other words, you dig 40 feet to uh, access the treasure. Another thing is, too, is the minus 21 degrees is also a reference to magnetic declination, uh, which uh, is very interesting. The 145 uh, is... Basically, what uh, Philip Stevenson says, uh, he thinks it belongs to a uh, solar azimuth heading, which I looked up, and the solar azimuth heading at 145 uh, minus the declination would be a reference to a date, which would be the winter solstice so or Christmas. So this is La Formula, and I show this for one reason, is we're going to get into uh, one of the discrepancies between the two documents, and that is the, uh, the spelling of 60, which is Sosente. And this is right here. You can see, if you look at this, there's the triangle dots here and the circle with the thing, a dot in the middle. This is basically saying uh, Sante. And it is, over here, it would be an S and an O. And this is Sosante, which is 60 in French. Now, there's a difference between the La Formula and the Stevenson document is that there's, in the Stevenson document, there's two S's, two of these before the I. So here's uh, La Formula, the translation. And we look here, this is what it says. And this is Olivier from Oak Island Research uh, did this translation. But you can see here's the 40, dig 40 feet. And the 45, and the 522, and the 1065. And here I put Sosanti. This is uh, not how it's translated in the formula. This is uh, a modern. Uh, it actually does not have an X in the formula. The formula does not. Kempton Cipher doesn't have an X. So. so here's the comparison between the two. And uh, the here's the Sosante right here. And you can see that there's two where after the three dots and here there is only one. So there's two different spellings of Sosante in this one and in this one. So if they're copycats, why would they change it? Another thing about this is look at the symbol for M up here. And there's another one right here. The symbol for M is different. Here's the symbol for M in the formula. Notice how it's like a stitches. You know, it's a line with two crosses. 
here and it goes down. Here it's more of like a cross on a base. Why would they change that? Why why would why would uh, Phil Stevenson change that if he was doing a copycat from La Formula or even the uh, ninety foot stone? He wouldn't. It's just a difference in the symbology that's changed because of who's doing the writing. It's the same cipher, but the symbol is just slightly different. Phil Stevenson wouldn't know how to do that. I mean, he wouldn't do that. So why? And why the difference in spelling? And the thing about this is these are both correct spellings. If you look, and I look, this is from the Anglo-Norman uh, dictionary, which is for uh, Old French. These are all the different uh, variations of the word 60. And you can see that there's many, many variations. But here's the one that's in La Formula right here. Or it could be this one, because we don't know. We only have from the IS. We don't know if it's SE, but this is, here's one that is in uh, SO. And here's the one that's in the Phil Stevenson document. This is exactly how it is. So this is a credible way of spelling 60. And how somebody would fake that, I don't know. So this is uh, the Kempton cipher that is, this is from uh, Phil Stevenson because it's got his mark from his, uh, uh, for M over here. But the reason I bring this up is uh, we're going to get into uh, an analogy that Phil Stevenson makes uh, about the 90 foot stone and that the letter G and the letter F are right next to each other. Okay. And they're very similar. The only difference is, is this line right here. Now we've seen this line in the 90 foot stone. Okay. So we're going to go to the Kempton cipher and we're going to look over here and we're going to, you're going to notice that the, here's the, the symbols for the 90 foot stone. Now notice one thing that they, appear in both lines. In other words, if Kempton or the uh, Leike, whoever they say created this cipher is a f as a fake, why would they put, why would they make this mistake here of this basically a non-symbol? Remember, the G is a, is a upside down triangle with a one slash, but this has two slashes. This has two slashes. Why are they repeating this mistake? It makes no sense. Here's Phil Stevenson's analogy, and I tend to agree with it, that these are actual, this is the actual symbols that were on the stone. As recorded, the one included even this one that is not even a symbol. And what Phil Stevenson says was that this was a mistake, that the person who was carving the uh, symbols into the stones accidentally put in the letter G since they're right next to each other. So he's looking at a cipher key and he actually chisels in a G instead of an F. When he's done, he realizes his mistake. And so right next to it, he, or what he does is he puts another cross through the triangle, through the G, to make it basically not a symbol at all. And then right next to it, to the left, he puts in the correct symbol for F. This to me makes more sense than this being made up and somebody just leaving this in. If this was made up, why would they even leave that in? Why not just change it to the correct one and redo it? It makes more sense. This is an actual recording of what was on the stone. And this mistake right here, to me, 
proves it. It also gives validity la formula because if this is a G symbol, which is found in the formula, and it's crossed out, then it gives validity to this symbol already being known during the time of the 90-foot stone, which also transfers over to La Formula because the G symbol is in La Formula. So that's the end of it. I hope I've uh, maybe convinced you a little bit that these documents here are all interconnected and they tell a story. Uh, they basically give, uh, the formula gives the directions of getting to the tunnel system. You dig 40 feet and at a 45 degree, degree angle, you dig uh, into basically into a tunnel system. And the Phil Stevenson document basically goes right in line with La Formula. However, we have a North Datum adjustant that may basically give us the date. My studies have shown that it basically relates to Oak Island with the minus 21 degrees declination is uh, between, uh, I believe it was 1490 to about, 1510. Uh, the solar azimuth heading, uh, I don't know if this relates to a solar azimuth heading, but it does relate to an actual date, which is very uh, esoteric, which is uh, the summer, the winter solstice or Christmas around that time of year. It also can relate to 145 is also the distance from the headstone to cone A, which very much relates to all these other numbers, the 522 and the uh, 1065 and the 45 degrees. And this is all in the vault theory. So thanks for watching. Uh, I will talk to you later.